Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. Back with some more vibe for all your yes I, you know. And uh, I did an episode, I believe it's called uh, The History of Greece in 18 Minutes. And then somebody said, well, you got to watch the series on Alexander. So this is the first part in the series on Alexander the Great, part one. So we're going to get into it and look up that history. I think I'm kind of excited about it because I have heard of Alexander before. I've read a little bit about him, but I have not gone in depth into the vibe and things. So now I'm going to dive into it. Thank you all for suggesting it. I didn't even know there was a series like that. There's a, it's four parts. This is the first part. Another thing I've noticed is that I keep saying, welcome to Bombastic Nation, but nobody knows my name. <laughs> But I won't give you my real name, so let's just call me Mr. Giant. Since I'm seven one, and all my shirts say Giant on it, just call me Mr. Giant. Boom! Just made one up right there. But anyway, I ain't gonna keep you all too long. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. In 334 BC, Alexander, King of Macedonia, began one of the greatest military campaigns in history against the superpower of the age, the Persian Empire. Just 20 years old, his brilliant and fearless leadership won him battle after battle. And in an astonishing 10-year campaign that took him to the edge of the known world, Ten he carved out one of the largest empires ever known. Few men have had such a massive impact on the course of history. To the Persians, he was Alexander the Accursed. The to accursed. the West, he was immortalized as Alexander the Great. Ancient Greece. From around 500 BC, this rugged land was the scene of remarkable developments in art, philosophy, and warfare. Its two greatest city-states were Athens, a naval power where democracy, art, drama, and philosophy flourished, and Sparta, Sparta. a militaristic society I like saying that. famed for its formidable army. In 480 BC, these two... This is to tell you how, such an influence that uh, Greece had on the world. Right across the bridge over here, there's a, 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 a little town named Athens, Ohio. Athens, boom. City-states have joined forces to fight an invasion by the mighty Persian Empire. At the narrow pass of Thermopylae, a small Greek force, led by 300 Spartans, held up the enormous Persian army for three days before they were finally encircled and killed. Then, in the Straits of Salamis, the Greek fleet defeated the Persian navy. But they couldn't prevent the Persians burning the sacred temples of the Athenian Acropolis. The next year at Plataea, the Greeks won a decisive land battle against the Persians and forced them to abandon their invasion. The next 50 years were the golden age of classical Greece. But rising tension between Athens and Sparta and their allies eventually led to war dragging the Greek world into decades of destructive fighting. Wars between the Greek city-states continued for almost a century. Wow. Leaving them exhausted and vulnerable to a new rising power to the north. For centuries, sophisticated Greeks had viewed the mountainous kingdom of Macedonia as a backwater, Hicksville, barely Greek at all. But under King Philip II, Macedonia emerged as a formidable military force. His most famous reform? 
the introduction of the Sarissa, an 18-foot pike, twice the length of a normal Greek spear, and wielded by trained infantry, fighting in close formation, known as a fat. <laughs> Even back then, military weapons that were better than... We invented better military weapons to kill each other. Even, <laughs> you know what I mean? Hey, they got that spear, let's make a longer one, and let's train our men, you know, to fight. We'll have a, a formidable force if we have the better weaponry and the, and the men trained to it, which is something the other side has never seen. And, and it's the same thing now, but, you know, you had the conventional weaponry, and then boom, somebody had the atomic bomb, and, you know, all this nuclear stuff is going on. So the world is being ruled by people with the best weapons and not the best propensity to love. Thanks. In 338 BC, at the Battle of Chironia, Philip's army crushed the joint forces of Thebes and Athens. Through alliance and conquest, Philip had already gained control over most of his neighbours. Now, following this victory, he united all Greece in an alliance known as the Hellenic League, or League of Corinth, with Philip as hegemon, or supreme commander. Only Sparta stood aside. Philip began to plan a great campaign, a pan-Hellenic or all-Greek war against the Persian Empire. Their old foe was now an ailing superpower, its great riches ripe for the taking. See, superpowers come and go. On the eve of launching his war, Philip was assassinated by his own bodyguard, victim of Macedonia's brutal court rivalries. He was succeeded by his 20-year-old son, Alexander, brilliant, restless, tutored by the great philosopher Aristotle, huh. already an experienced military commander. Alexander the philosopher is held in the war grand but... plan to invade Persia, but first he had to secure his own position as king. At home he had potential rivals executed, then crushed rebellions in Illyria, Thessaly and central Greece. He made a special example of Thebes, completely destroying the ancient city and selling its people into slavery. Wow. In the spring of 334 Now that would demoralize us as a, 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 a people. against the Persian Empire, Alexander led his army across the Hellespont into Asia Minor. He's it coming. the start of one of the greatest military campaigns in history. Wow. Man is going to we'll bust him up. Alexander's army was about 40,000 strong, drawn from all parts of Greece. The infantry were commanded by the veteran Macedonian general Parmenia. In the front rank, 9,000 Macedonian phalangites armed with the 18-foot Sarissa. These were professional soldiers, well-trained and drilled, who formed up for battle in the phalanx, 16 ranks deep. This packed formation presented a solid wall of iron spear tips and was virtually unstoppable. But it was also difficult to maneuver and highly vulnerable to attacks on its flanks or rear. So 3,000 elite infantry, the hypaspists, or shield bearers, armed with shorter spears, guarded its flanks. Wow, but he planned they that. They were commanded by Parmenion's son, Nicanor. The second line of Alexander's army was made up of 7,000 Greek allies and 5,000 mercenaries, armed as hoplites. They took their name from the hoplon, their large round shield, and carried shorter eight-foot spears. A hoplite phalanx was not as effective as the Macedonian phalangites, but still well armed and heavily armoured for the time. <laughs> this is interesting to the see the Arianes least. The were the army's elite skirmishers, 
expert javelin throwers from what's now southern Bulgaria. Other skirmishers from Thrace and Illyria were armed with javelins, slings and bows. The shock troops of Alexander's army were the Man, <laughs> this dude's got different sections with different armies with different uh oh man who am i putting this year because you got the guys with the long spears you got the guys with the short spears you got the guys with slings and bows and you got the guys with uh the big shields i mean he had everything covered there for that wartime period can you imagine seeing that coming to you if you have a, a like a, for then a conventional type military Companion cavalry 1,800 elite horsemen, armed with spear and horsemen sword, too. commanded by Philotas, another son of Parmenia. Alexander family led affair. the royal squadron in person. There were also 1,800 cavalry from Thessaly, commanded by Callas. 600 from other parts of Greece, led by Eregius. And 900 mounted scouts from Thrace and Paeonia, under Cassandra. The great Persian Empire was divided into provinces called satrapies. Each satrapy was ruled by a governor or satrap. Those in Asia Minor, now threatened by Alexander's invasion, met to discuss strategy. Memnon of Rhodes, a skilled Greek general in Persian service, urged them to avoid battle with Alexander. Instead, he advised them to use a scorched earth strategy, to burn villages and crops and withdraw to the interior. Wow! Alexander's army, he promised, would quickly starve. Oh, that was, was the plan. advice, but the satraps were unwilling to lay waste to their own provinces without a fight. So they decided to face Alexander's army at the river Granicus. The Persian army formed up behind the river, which was shallow, but 60 feet wide with steep banks. Their front line was a wall of cavalry, about 10,000 horsemen from across the empire. Medes and Hyrcanians from like watching Iran, a movie here. Bactrians from Afghanistan, and Paphlagonians from Turkey's Black Sea coast. Behind, in reserve, were the infantry, several thousand Greek mercenaries, a common sight in Persian armies at this time. These men fought for Persian gold, and were armed with the round shield and short spear of hoplites. The Persians may have been unsure if they could trust these men in combat against fellow Greeks, and so placed them at the rear. <laughs> they could attack you from behind. Determined to attack and destroy this Persian force before it could retreat, raced to the Granicus with his best troops. On his left wing, he posted Thessalian, Greek, and Thracian cavalry under Parmenian's command. In the center were the massed spears of the phalanx, its six divisions commanded by Perdiccas, Koinos, Amintas, Philip, Meliager, and Crateros. Crateros. On the right, Alexander himself with the companion cavalry under Philotas, as well as the elite hypaspists, the Agrianis javelin throwers. See, back in the day, the leaders went out there. They were on the battlefield. <laughs> Nowadays, they just send poor people out to fight. <laughs> well, they sit up in their big fat houses and things, saying, oh, we got to do this, we got to do that. Alexander is out on the front lines, man. I'm, I'm not saying that's a glorious thing or anything like that. Not to bring, because I'm on war and I'm on no friend. But he was out there. He wasn't sitting somewhere all safe and nice, yelling at poor people's kids to go die. 
and the archers. Alexander, with 13,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry in all, was probably slightly outnumbered. But ignoring advice to wait until dawn to cross the river, he ordered an immediate assault. He sent a squadron of companion cavalry to ford the river, followed by a regiment of hypaspists and the Paeonian Light Cavalry. Alexander, calling on his men to show their courage, then led his right wing across the river. I mean, they're wide open. That wouldn't As work in these the times. Of the, river, the Greeks came under a hail of javelins, darts, and arrows from the Persian line. Those that made it to the far bank were immediately charged by the Persian cavalry. Alexander was in the thick of the fighting. Didn't do anything that he didn't want his people to do. Cavalry and leaders were stationed. Around him, a desperate conflict raged. Horses were jammed against horses, and men against men. The Macedonians striving to drive the Persians away from the riverbank. The Persians determined to prevent them crossing and to push them back into the river. Uh, back, back against the river, not back against the wall. Alexander's attack seemed reckless, but he was buying time for the rest of his army to cross the river, including the irresistible Macedonian phalanx. Then, suddenly, Alexander was fighting for his life charged by two Persian nobles. Roisasses rode up to Alexander and struck him on the head with his sword, breaking off a piece of his helmet. But the helmet broke the force of the blow, and Alexander struck him down with his lance. Then, from behind, Spithridates raised his sword against the king, but Black Clytus, son of Dropidus, anticipated his blow, struck his arm, and cut it off. Sword and all. Oh, man. Uh, that's a horrible way to die. Now the Greek army was across the river, and the Persian cavalry faced a wall of Macedonian spears. Most turned and fled. We should have gone into the interior. Alexander's attack meant Persia's Greek mercenaries hadn't even had time to join the battle. Alexander, in a blood rage, or possibly regarding these Greeks as traitors, ignored their appeals for mercy. The mercenaries were surrounded on all sides and massacred. Alexander had won a great victory. Asia Minor now lay at his mercy. But the Persian Empire was still a land of immense wealth and power. Already, it was mobilizing its vast resources to face him. If Alexander was to conquer this empire and take his place in history, he'd next have to face Darius, King of Kings himself. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. That is some serious storytelling. This guy is good. This guy is good. I'm gonna leave a link in this in the comment there, a link in the description box, so you guys could go check it out yourself without me breaking in and out and stuff. But this this guy is doing some really good storytelling there because I was uh, riveted by it you know what I mean so this is really cool check this channel out I bet they have a whole lot of other stuff this is the first time I've been on this channel because I'm reading the Alexander thing you know but uh, wow I mean you hear about Alexander and stuff but you you know did they gloss over it in history but the storytelling here tells you of the the viciousness of everything that's going on. Of course, every war is vicious and everybody could uh, sort of imagine it and everything, but still, 
You know what I mean? That's crazy. But uh, I, I, stay tuned for the part two. I'm going to watch the part two, too. This was really good. I really enjoyed You know, I mean, the storytelling was really good. I really enjoyed it. The fact that it's a war and all these people are dying. And then, you know, what a way to go, man. Swords and spears and, you know. Even a slingshot, you know, hit you with a stone and you're, and you, you're stunned and somebody's chopping at you and stabbing at you. I don't understand wars, why we want to do that to each other. Even if it's for territory, even if it's for money, if it's, even if it's for ideology. Does anything really get solved? I mean, you know, because like, you know, I, I'm not speaking specifically of this. I'm just speaking in modern times because, you know, everybody's trying to make money. So everybody's selling weaponry to everybody and, you know, everybody's armed and, you know, everybody wants to beat everybody. And it's just, it's just a whole mess we're in right now. That's where we got to come together. Use places like YouTube, learn about each other. So when they say, they bad, we know better. We know better. You know what I mean? Channels like mine that uh, that react to this stuff and, and we, we give you the history and, and some of us give you all insights and stuff like that. You know, even go to this channel and, and, and watch it. But, you know, when you're watching it, look at it from a human perspective. Human. It's one race. And that's the human race. One pure race. And that's the human race. Because we're all so mixed up anyway. Because look, when Alexander crossed there and went into Persia, you know they're mixed with all those people that are there. So there's nothing pure about them as far as a race is concerned. Uh, uh, a different race. It's a human race. Anyway, I ain't going to babble on too much and dig. I remember, you could call me Mr. Giant, like my shirt said. <laughs> Listen, man, take care of each other, all right? Cool runnings.